I didn't know much about pornography as a young kid. And I was a grown up and I have a PhD in pornography, but as a child, a of, he has a lot of porn. <laughs> so, uh, uncomfortable moments. Oh, man, you, <laughs> you got quiet there for a second. Did that so, touch a nerve, all your porn? <laughs> I was on a date once and Ian and his wife just kept screaming to my date, Frankie, what's with all the porn? <laughs> It was like, I don't even have that much. It was just uncomfortable. No but, longer dating her. No longer dating her. <laughs> clearly, clearly. You're listening to Let Me Speak to a Manager with Frank Cava and Ian Matthews. What a crack of shit. Yeah, that was a hot mic, Sam. You can't say God here. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Frankie! Ian, you son of a bitch! Frankie, you, uh, you dragged me into this episode kicking and screaming, and uh, I gotta tell you, I couldn't be more excited now that I'm here. <laughs> Ian's positive attitude will no doubt show through in this episode. So, tell me uh, the story we're about on the when 50th you- anniversary of Watergate, yep. right? When when is yep. the 50th anniversary? And what what actual is the date? What is the anniversary of when he resigned or when they broke so, the story? So we are recording this in the middle of June. June 17th, uh, 1972 was the Watergate break-ins. That's the, when the burglars were caught in the middle of the morning, breaking into, hard to believe it was a, a luxurious place. It's this concrete monster that's like a series of half circles that overlooks the DC water um, down by the uh, the river. Um, but there was uh, the Republican National Convention was going on and um, some people broke in, some burglars. It was mostly people from Cuba. There was one former CIA agent and um, the story is 50 plus years old at this point. I've been fascinated with it since I was a kid. I'll tell you why I'm fascinated by it. Um, it turns out that Nixon had this whole thing, they call it rat fucking. And rat fucking is basically espionage or counter intelligence against people. And it, the, the Watergate is just a small part of the process, but he kind of pushed and prodded his way into who he ran against for reelection. There was a guy named Muskie. Muskie was this fascinating character who was a really good candidate. And they wrote this bogus letter. Did you hear about the Canuck letter? No. So it was basically like a racist letter telling someone that Muskie was a racist against French Canadians. So like it disqualified him. It was like before there was Fox News, it was this, it made na- national news. It was a complete fabrication by the people that were inside of Rick, uh, Nixon's employ. The reason this is personal for me <clears throat> is in the re-election, in, I think it was 1972, um, Nixon ran against a guy named McGovern. Do you know how many states McGovern won? No. One. Do you know what state that was? Florida. Massachusetts, where my parents lived at the time. So when Nixon ended up resigning and all this was going crazy, there was this bumper sticker, which my dad had, that said, Massachusetts, we told you so. And... Um, <laughs> And if you talk to my dad, it's the only president. I don't think he's voted since. He's like, I voted for McGovern. I liked that guy. I thought Nixon was a crook. So I don't know what it is about this particular thing, but I'm interested in it. It spurred a great movie that was nominated for eight Academy Awards and won four. It has no superheroes or people with capes, so Ian hated it. But the point of the matter is it's like something that's really unique history-wise. And what we're going to talk about isn't the actual break-in or why or all that. But I think there's four or five storylines that work very well with what we talk about here. And it talks about the company. It talks about management. It talks about young employees. It talks about being a man of integrity and protecting your word and where those things go. So to me, I think this is a fun episode because it's timely and it's something that I've read, I don't know, six or seven books on the subject. And I think it's interesting. So Frank brought this up to me uh, a few weeks ago because the 50th anniversary was coming up and he was excited and he already wrote an outline and uh, loyal listeners to this uh, show will know that Frank almost never writes an outline without 
without me starting it or telling him exactly what he needs to do. So um, he I write, an outline as, I write an outline as frequently as Ian saves a password in a place he can remember it. OK, all, all true. So I was like, oh, Frank really wants to do this. But the problem was I've never been super excited about the Watergate story. Um, it's just happened a long time ago. And I know I know the details of it, sort of, but uh, I've been to the Watergate Hotel. I've done the tour where they take you into the actual room where they, you know, someone walks you up there and they walk you around the room. And uh, I've done it all. It's, it's vaguely interesting to me, but I've never seen any of the movies. I haven't read anywhere near what Frank has read on it. So uh, to show you the how ludicrous my life is. Um, uh, so yesterday was Tuesday and uh, I downloaded all the president's men because frank told me to and at 10 in the morning i started watching a movie and i could barely get like this was the highlight of my work day yesterday was watching all the president's men and it took me three and a half hours to watch a two hour and 15 minute movie because i kept falling asleep and i would have to rewind to like the last part where i was at and i still had some of the pieces are uh vaguely but it was it's probably the hardest work day I've put in in weeks yesterday was just grinding through this movie, getting through it. So, but I am prepared because I am a goddamn professional and I am ready to talk about Watergate and Nixon and the Washington Post uh, today. So, so the two funny anecdotes before we get into the, the heart of this. So Ian's son is also named Ian. He goes by a moniker. Um, but on Saturday, Ian and his son called me from speakerphone from the car, and we almost had a fill-in, Ian Jr., not Ian, because Ian was so unenthused about this. And I told my wife, I was like, Ian doesn't want to do this podcast. She's like, why don't I make like a cutout of him and we'll put like a yarn wig together and you can do it by yourself. <laughs> I had asked, I asked Frank, can I just have IJ show up? I'll have, I'll put him behind the mic. He'll have as much to add about Watergate as I do. He's been to the hotel. He's been to the actual room. IJ can just sit behind the mic and you can talk to him the whole time about how, how much you love the story. All right. So I'll let you do what you do, which is lead. And then just push me through it, pal. Okay, so tell everyone, uh, in, give the Wikipedia summary, right? So Watergate is now kind of a metonym for uh, any kind of major scandal with lots of intrigue behind it and complications. So uh, when Tom Brady deflated a bunch of footballs in the Super Bowl, everyone called it deflate gate because there was a big conspiracy. There was a lot of lying going around. There was a lot of double crossing. There was destroying of evidence. There were a lot of similar things to Watergate. And so Watergate has kind of become synonymous with scandals, with uh, double crossing, with a lot of backdoor creepy dealing. So give everyone, Frank, just the, the Wikipedia two minute summary of exactly what the Watergate scandal was. Okay, so in its simplest form, I mentioned this a second ago in the intro, but in its simplest form, there were burglars who were caught breaking into the Democratic National Convention or the, um, the offices. So Nixon was a Republican. These were the Democrats and the Democrats had rented a space inside the Watergate Hotel. And what happened was at like two or three o'clock in the morning, there was burglars in there and there was a security guard that kind of noticed something was off. They called the night they called 911 in the beginning of the movie all the president's man with Ian just referenced like a group of people show up and they're like they look like hippies the reason is is they were non plain clothes they were the closest people there so they send this group in and the group is like police officers but they're dressed in like you know they're 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 what's called a vice squad. A vice squad is like working the hookers and the, the drug beats and all that stuff. They were the first crew available. So they're the ones who busted up. So there's an arrest. There's a, a simple burglary. But what happens is the Washington Post is headquartered eight blocks away from the Watergate Hotel, at least at the time. And there was a couple of young, hungry reporters who thought that this was something bigger. And they refused to let it go. So there was a period in the movie or in the book or, you know, in history where there was 5,000 reporters in Washington, D.C., five people all working for the Washington Post were following the story. 
this story almost got swept under the rug. One of the things that you're hearing a lot about now is the January 6th trials, right? And it's come out in something that I read the other day. They're like, if Fox News existed in 1972, Richard Nixon probably does not, he probably does not resign. He doesn't get impeached. So this is something that I think is actually pretty unique and pretty neat because someone was doing something wrong and the free press is the ones who caused it to come to the light. And we're going to not talk about like what side of the politics are on or all that. I want to talk about the guys. I want to talk about the Washington Post. I want to talk about Bob Woodward. I want to talk about Ben Bradley. I want to talk about Catherine Graham. That's the business side of the story. Like we watch The Godfather where there's it's a gangster movie and talk about the business component. The business component is what I'm interested in talking about here, not what side of the politics are the, you? The on? post forced it to light. What were the guys doing in breaking in? What were they doing? Were they there to wiretap so that they wiretap? Yeah. So what they, were they going to use that information for? So no, that's what was such a mystery. Nobody knew he was running against this dipshit McGovern who couldn't win. They knew he couldn't win. He was ahead by twelve points in the polls when this happened. So they're like, why would they break in? It makes no sense. And what happened was, and this is what the Post uncovered through all their incredible research, is, oh my God, this is just one thing. Like this break-in isn't it. There's a whole counter espionage thing happening here directed by the White House, and they're doing it in multiple facets of, of, of governance. They were doing it in elections. They were doing it in departments of government. So it became this whole thing. Nixon did not resign because these guys broke in. He, he resigned because there was all of these atrocities that were committed. And these people who had a conviction stood up and went in and researched it and pushed very hard on something they believed in that almost everybody else thought was ludicrous. It was the tip of the iceberg that they figured out, you know, that had that not come to light, they wouldn't have been able to drill into the fact that the Nixon administration was using the FBI, the CIA, the IRS as political weapons. He was using, he was weaponizing the, you know, and you you have to separate all that, but he was weaponizing all of it. And it really brought a lot of ugliness, you know, through all the trials and everything that came out of it, uh, of just how ugly that administration was. And it forced him to the point where he just lost all political support. Um, That's right. But it's wild how long he kept support all the way through all of it. Um, so ultimately, he gets before he can even uh, be kicked out of office, he gets impeached, he resigns, uh, he gets in front of the, you know, so this is a definitely a David versus Goliath story, in my opinion, where uh, a newspaper that was still relatively regional at the time went and took down an entire, I mean, it's the only time you've ever had a sitting president resign took down an administration that was that powerful and popular. That's right. All that It's interesting that you didn't have a great, I, I was hoping that one of your books would have told, I never understood why they did it because I, it's not like he was losing by six points in the polls and he was desperate. And this, he found out some info and sprung it on them. He was going to kill him no matter what. That's, that's why. Is that, just, no is that just like hubris gone wild? Like, just cause I can, I'm just do whatever. So I've, I've nerded out on this. Um, the, the reason is Richard Nixon was an incredible narcissist and he was, a, an, an, he was an insane warrior. He was paranoid. He recorded everything. He did like all these crazy things. He was just a paranoid kind of guy. And this went back decades. So when he finally got to this point, like here's a fact, do you know the wiretapping of the White House, or like of the Oval Office? Do you know this story? Mm -hmm. no. So, so someone who predated Nixon, it was either Kennedy or LBJ, wired the Oval Office. So if there was ever meetings in there, they could use it as like an espionage tool. Nixon didn't like it, so he removed it. But then he started thinking, I'm gonna get reelected. I want this <laughs> reinstalled to protect my legacy. Oh, and so those, are the, those are the tapes that ended up hanging him. Correct. That, that's, that's where he ended up busting himself because he's giving the order to do some of this stuff. Correct. And he'd had all of them taken out, but he had them put back in because of his ego. But if you like, why would the White House break in, the Republican White House break into a Democratic convention if you're winning by two touchdowns in points? Like most national, like 
Trump never won the popular vote. Like these things are usually razor thin. A 12 point margin in politics is a landslide. So like it didn't make any sense, but Woodward and Bernstein are the reporters and they just, they wouldn't let it go. There was something in there that perturbed them enough to keep kind of digging into it. And that's where everything kind of came out of it. Okay. So how does the Washington Post find out about it? Other than the fact that they just saw it on the, it was a, it was a story on the nightly news that someone had broken into the Democratic National Convention at, at the Watergate Hotel. Yeah, so they're a news organization. So they didn't wait for Walter Cronk, right? They, they have someone that monitored the police blotters and they're like, five people got arrested at the you know, Republican National Convention or the, 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 the RNC. So they're like, okay, let's send the reporter. So they send a reporter and as soon as that reporter is Woodward and he gets there and he realizes, well, the five people who arrested didn't call an attorney. They're all dressed in suits. They have like $2,300 in sequential bills, which means they got it directly from a bank. And back then that was a lot of money to have in hundreds. And they went to court. They never made a phone call, but there was an attorney there to represent them. So there was enough stuff like pretty early where you're like, this is really odd. Like they're in suits, they're breaking in at three o'clock in the morning. They have bunches of money and just an attorney just so happens to show up. So that's kind of how it started. And they just thought it was maybe a story. What was interesting is one of the got two of the people got arrested of the five and they got arrested with um, like address books. And in both of the address books, they had the name of somebody who worked in the White House. And it said in one, it said WH and the other one it put W period house. So it just started the curiosity of like, why would they have these people's names in an address book? And what the president in the office, the White House did is they just denied everything. They just flatly denied everything. It was that scene in the movie about the denials. It, like they, they, there was no dialogue. There was no communication. They probably with a creative answer. They could have thwarted it, but instead of, they were just arrogant and they just said, nope, it didn't happen. Go away, you peasants. And these people got pissed off and dug in. So Bob Woodward gets randomly kind of just selected because it wasn't a real big story and he was still relatively new at the post. Is that right? He's 28 years old. He's been there nine months. He interviewed about a year before he was ultimately hired. And they're like, you have no experience. You're out of the Navy. You're really smart, but you can't write. So he had to move to Maryland to learn his skill and his craft. And he worked for what was called a weekly paper back then. So not nearly the type of clout. This is the seventies. Newspapers were important. Most newspapers had two copies that would go out a day because that was the way you got your news. It wasn't cable. And there was three, there's three television channels. This was really important. Yeah. So he went to, he went to Maryland. He learned how to write. And then he came back to the post. He's only there nine months. He'd only done, you know, a handful of stories. And he was, a, this was a, this was a bullshit story that nobody cared about. So they called their rookie, the rookie guy and said, go look at it. So Woodward looks at it. He finds out more detail than people were expecting when he goes out there. He does some good uh, investigative reporting. He sniffs out some of the weirdness of it and then starts to get some stories and they're kind of dropping it into the middle of the paper at first. They're not really, these aren't front page. No one wants to really make accusations. It's kind of out there. Is this, when does Bernstein learn about him. All right. So I'm going to say something before we get to Bernstein, which is really fascinating. So this is where management comes in. So a good company, the Washington Post is a family company that's owned by the Graham family, right? Um, it, it, she got that name through marriage. It, it was a different name, but the person who founded the company left it to Catherine Graham's husband. Catherine Graham was the daughter of the founder. Um, she was a socialite. This is the 1950s and 1960s, came into the 70s. Like she didn't work. Women didn't work back then. Her husband ends up killing himself and she's a socialite, but this paper means something to her. So what she decides to do is she decides to say, screw it. I'm going to run this paper as the owner. Now, she is not a micromanager. She understands this. She has a guy named Ben Bradley that works for her. He's remarkable. He's, a, he's the editor of the entire paper. She's the owner. He's the editor. 
when Woodward finds this story, Bradley's looking at it, he realizes what's happening. This isn't Bradley's first fight with the White House. He fought with the White House over the Korean War and something that broke and it was covered in a movie called The Post. Um, and what Bradley did is he looked at the first articles that came out from these guys and he said, you're making huge accusations. You don't have great sourcing. There's nobody, he, like they asked the question of like, you know, who's this from? And he goes, you want a name? He goes, no, rank. And like, they didn't have it. So what he did is he took the story, he neutered it, he got some of the details out and he buried it. But there's a couple of lessons there. Ben Bradley's been to war before. He's a good manager. So he's like, I'm not gonna take a shot on something that isn't substantiated. My guys are green. I need to teach them how to not be green. So this is the reason I wanted to do this episode. If this was a bad manager or a micromanager or someone who doesn't know how to cultivate talent, this story goes away. Richard Nixon walks. We never talk about this again. But because Bradley would knew the fight and he knew how serious the fight was, and he knew how one or two early stories wouldn't win the war, he made them a little bit less powerful. He buried them to get some momentum. And as momentum started to pick up and public kind of interest picked up, and that's what sells newspapers, then he started moving it from the back pages to the front pages. Uh, I, another thing that I liked is the fact that yes he took a chance on them but great managers especially when you get young people that come in they've got these great ideas and and a lot of times they're just shooting from their gut we need to do this or i see a competitor doing this so we should do it and you could see that with a young reporter they want to they want to break some big story i love that scene where he just redlines half of it so it's not sourced get some more information and i think I think good managers and companies do the same thing. You want me to go spend this money? Show me the return. Go show me the return. Go show me more success than what you've showed so far. You can't just make a bunch of assumptions and ask me to invest in something. Go test it. Go, go dig a little more, get a little bit more factual, get a little more analytical, and maybe then I'll go invest in what you're asking for. But you can't, you can't go to any strong manager and just say, my gut says we should run this. We should do this. That's it. And he, he, he's not a young manager. He's a seasoned and old manager. Like in the movie, he's got a lot of gray hair. And in real life, he was probably in his 50s when this all happened. And that's relevant because he knew it wasn't strong enough. But he didn't completely, he didn't completely take away the story or say stop doing it or chase something else. That's what reporters are supposed to do. And that's how you cultivate a good crew of reporters is you push them. You say, this is weak for these reasons, go out and do it again. So there's a scene in the movie, Woodward is just starting on this story. And um, as you said, he's a, a very good investigative reporter. He's not a good writer at this point. And there's yep. a scene where a writer by the name of Carl Bernstein, who's played by Dustin Hoffman, kind of intercepts his story without really telling him kind of pulls it, rewrites the first paragraph. And uh, Bob Woodward confronts him. What the hell are you doing in my story? That, that he's not been assigned to him yet. He doesn't really, they don't, they're not friends. And he just like, well, I, I thought the first story could be written better. It's, you got the details right, but you were burying the lead. And they get into a little bit of an argument. And Woodward says, you're right, yours is written better. I like your writing better. I don't like the way you handled it. Like, don't go behind my back and try to rewrite my stuff. So I'm curious, is that Hollywood or did it really happen that way? When you read the book, did it really happen where he kind of just barged his way in or did Bradley, the manager, say, go help this kid write better because he's a writer? It was a little bit more management than the movie. Bernstein is a scrappy kid. So Woodward... Hart or Yale and the Navy. Bernstein, 16 years old, like I think he graduated high school, but he never went to college. He just started to write for the Washington Post. So he's just a scrappy, know how to do a guy. This happened when they were 28 and 29. So this is, he'd been at the paper for 12 or 13 years by this point. He was better, but he also was kind of a scrapper. Like he wasn't the, um, you know, the, the blue blood, the Yale educated. He was, so there was a comedy. He had something to prove always. Always had a chip on his shoulder. And it was also find your own shit. So he knew he was good at writing, 
but he wasn't as good at reporting. Reporting is a skill that takes a lot of smarts. He was street smart. So he saw this thing. He agreed with what was happening in the tide and he got on it. And it was a combination of Bernstein wanting to do like glom on like they show in the movie. And it was a combination of, hey, stick the two young kids on it because collectively they're better. You got a great researcher and a great writer. But to me, it was actually a, a good bit of management that made that happen. Now, there's something they didn't talk about in the movie. When Woodward and Bernstein started this whole process, there was like somewhere between five and eight people at the post working on it. The scene they show in the movie that Ian just explained is the last moment either of them was attributed to the story, not together. From that moment on, everything they did, even if one of them wrote it, it was both of their names and they started to work on it together and collectively because they had different skills. Ian and I are very similar in a lot of ways, but we have different skills. I find the real estate deal, Ian writes the story. He's a better writer than I am. So we all know what we're doing. We have a similar level of understanding. We have different strengths. That's why I thought this was a cool and compelling story to talk about because they were allowed to be different. They were working and circling the same drain, but they were using different skill sets. He's been called, Woodward has been called, the Babe Ruth of investigative journalism. They don't say that about Bernstein. Bernstein was great at getting headlines. If he had incredible reams of data, but nobody read it, the story goes nowhere. So collectively, you put the two people together and it works insanely well. I think there's also um, what I find interesting and a parallel to a lot of things that I've done in my career. This story was... You know, if you put yourself in Woodward's shoes before anything came out, it was high pressure. No one believed them. They were one of five out of 5,000 reporters that were even trying to cover the story. Then when they started getting close to the sun and they started getting real facts and real things that were unsettling to the White House, then they started getting death threats. Then they started getting pressure to back off, to get out of the way. I think having partners in business, I feel like I've always had them. I've even in big companies, even at GE, I had Macaulay that was going through the same things as me. And we worked on everything together, even though we had different regions. And I feel like I had a few people like that at MVR. Now you and I are working on this. I do real estate deals with you, with Keep. I've got David, where you've got, you're feeling all this pressure anyway. As allies. Founder. As an owner, as a founder, as an investor, it's stressful being out there all on your own. And when you're under that kind of pressure, man, sometimes it's better to give up some of your equity and have someone else feeling some of the same pressure and stresses as you. So you have someone with skin in the game that you can talk to because it's, it's a hell of a burden to take it all on yourself. So I think one of the values just with those two between Bernstein and, and Woodward, they both had skills but they also had each other. They throughout the movie, they just keep showing them at McDonald's, you know, sitting there smoking cigarettes, stressed out, eating cheating you know, quarter pounders and stressing out over what's going to work. There's a lot to be said for having good partnerships in your career and having people that you can really rely on that have the same skin in the game. Nickel used to call me the king of insignificant facts. Did you happen to pause it and look at how much the burgers cost? They were between 15 and 35 cents. Yeah, like 30 cents, 30 cents. Yeah, I, was, I, I, did, I did happen to notice it. Is, uh, do you know, was there any product placement? But did McDonald's pay to have themselves in that movie so much? No, nah, that, was, that was early. The first product placement was actually Rocky, which was five years later. Really? Yeah. That's a fact? First, first yeah. uh, what was it? What was the product? can't remember it had something to do with the fight i don't remember the product but that, that was the first product placement fascinating fascinating we're gonna have to have uh, our editor put it in the notes frank always says check in the notes we'll put it there uh quick fact i'm the one that writes the notes and i never put it there so don't actually check the notes when frank says that he's just trying to sound smart um <laughs> So, uh, we don't have anyone on our <laughs> staff to put things in notes. So whenever he says that, I'm like, mm, yeah, Frank, yeah, you're going to put that in the notes, homie. You don't even know where to put it. You don't even have the password to get into our notes. <laughs> That's not my fault. Yeah, so I want to say something else before we move off of this part, right? So there's a quote in the book and in the movie, and it says this, if it's so important, why did you give it to Woodward and Bernstein? That's the way of someone saying like, 
this is a dog shit story. You should just dismiss it. If you actually were going to give it any type of, if it was important to you to write this story, it doesn't go to these guys. So this is kind of the arc of how things go. The unimportant stuff goes to the low people on the totem pole. But this is where I think something fabulous happened. Bradley, at this point, when this story is starting to get a little bit of steam, as Ian was talking about a second ago, anybody wants this story now. This isn't dog shit anymore. This is now real, like big boy journalism. So the national desk wanted it. The Metro wanted it. Everybody wanted it. People with 20, 30, 40 years wanted it. And Bradley said, these are the guys that got us here. Now, he's going to say something similar later, but these are the guys that got us here. They're the ones who got it this far. Stick with them. This is where belief in someone young, even though they're young or less experienced, matters. This is where giving really good guidance matters. We did a podcast recently about micromanagement. This isn't micromanagement. This is macro management. These are giving big context items. I don't care what you find. I don't care where you find it. Source it. Double, triple check it. That's the type of stuff that happened. And this is the type of management stuff that led to two very young and inexperienced people breaking one of the biggest stories in the history of, you know, journalism. So they start doing some big J journalism. They start doing some reporting. They start doing some digging. They find some checks from a bank in Miami that are tied to the crooks that were paid through the Republican National Convention, which is big news. Um, and even then people are kind of saying you still don't have much. The White House is denying everything. But really what starts breaking for Woodward is his relationship with an unnamed source who would, who would go unnamed for 40 years. Talk a little bit about Mark Felt, uh, who was known in the public eye as Deep Throat. I think this is probably another reason I've always found this story fascinating. It, like, I didn't know much about pornography as a young kid. And I was a grown up and I have a PhD in pornography, but as a child, a of, he has a lot of porn. <laughs> so, um, uh, uncomfortable moments. With oh man, you, <laughs> you got quiet there for a second. Did that so, touch a nerve, all your porn? <laughs> I was on a date once and Ian and his wife just kept screaming to my date, Frankie, what's with all the porn? <laughs> it was like, I don't even have that much. It was just uncomfortable. No but, longer dating her. No longer dating her. <laughs> clearly, clearly. So the point we're driving at here with Mark Felt, he was nicknamed Deep Throat. Deep Throat was the pornographic movie of the day. It was like in all the theaters back then, it was a very, very seedy name. So they put him on what was called Deep Background. He was never sourced, cited, his position was never told or, or known. And it turns out he was the number two. When Hoover died, um, he was the head of the FBI. He was actually the acting director of the HB FBI for a period of time. And um, Nixon appointed a crony and he was pissed. He was pissed off that he appointed this crony. Now, the reason that this thing all started and how Woodward and felt or deep throat started a, um, a relationship is Woodward was in the Navy and he was given an assignment. Now this is in the book, it's not in the movie. Um, and he was sent to the White House and he was at the White House for like hours and hours just sitting there. And this man walked in who he struck up a conversation with that ultimately became um, deep throat and they started talking. He was also in the Navy, they had a lot of similarities and over time, Woodward would just call this guy and, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. It was just very small check-ins of, I'm thinking about going to law school. He didn't even ask him anything. He just built a friendship through written word and through phone calls. So years later, when Woodward decided to become a reporter, this guy was pretty high up, never quoted him. Um, but they would talk about big things. There was an assassination attempt. So what happened was it started small. My biggest private investor has lent me more than $50 million total um, over, to, over the history of my business. It's a big deal for my business. My business is way further ahead than it would be without this person. It started with one deal, a $250,000 loan. That's what happened. It was one really small relationship that was nurtured. There was trust and the relationship built. And when it was time for someone to help 
Deep Throat, which Ian can explain better than me, um, was a critical figure in this entire episode. And Woodward kept him as a confidential source all the way until the guy was almost dead. And then he came out because he needed some money. It was, uh, what, what happened? It, it, it was, it was in his dying days, right? He had some debts to pay and he needed to come out, write a book. He and had, all. Yeah. So th- this all takes place like 1972 to 1974. Nixon resigned early August of 74. Mark felt came out in 2005 as deep throat. And his daughter, had no money and she encouraged him to come out and he got a bunch of money from a couple of magazines. And when he came out and, you know, the agreement was I'll protect you until you die or until you admit it and Woodward did. So I think we can go down a rabbit hole with Mark Felt and Deep Throat and what relationships really mean, but that was a key figure behind the scenes. And he was kind of a fact checker. He wouldn't, he wouldn't give him anything that would tip off that it was him tipping him off. But at the same time, he would kind of keep them in line. And they got in trouble by going, you know, they flew a little too close to the sun a couple of times and it kind of grounded the investigation. But this was a key source. And like when you look at these things long term, like relationships, accomplishments, young people, Woodward and Bernstein, had great ownership, they had great management, and they had support. They had, they had different people behind the scenes that were giving them information. Some were being sourced and some were not, but you don't get anywhere of note on your own and it requires a support staff. I felt like uh, there's a couple of things that I took away from just the, the story in general that I think, that, that I think are, are similar in a career. So there's a, there's a scene where Bernstein is trying to go down and talk to a politician in Florida about the checks that they had found that were linked. <laughs> and this gatekeeper is not letting him in. She's like, I'll check his schedule tomorrow. He's like, I flew down here because I thought I was gonna be meeting with this guy. And he ends up leaving and makes a fake phone call to her and says there's some shipment of boxes downstairs, something like that. And she goes, gets in an elevator, goes down. And as soon as she leaves her desk, he storms right past her gate, you know, her gatekeeper and walks right into this politician's office. And he's like, who the hell are you? And he just starts demanding, we're gonna talk. And then she comes back in and she gives him this you know, dirty look. And he's like, tough I flew all the way down here. I'm gonna get some information. And there's, there's multiple cases in this story where they work outside of the rules. Uh, Frank calls it getting a little too close to some, but they kind of work outside of the rules using deep cover. Uh, okay, that's that's, kind of standard but the, the, the some of the things they were doing to get the story to break they weren't really playing within the rules they were and nor was nixon's administration right so, so sometimes sometimes to beat somebody who's not playing by the rules you can't really play by the rules but i i like the fact that these guys just didn't take no for an answer they just you know good salespeople just kind of keep And they kept going back to the same sources. Like, that's a dead end. Let's go back to it. Let's go back to it. They went to that same lady three different times, knocked on her door, knocked on her door, knocked on her door. Till one time she was ready to talk. And it was, uh, to me, it's a story of resilience because they just kept getting stonewalled everywhere they went. No one really supported them doing the story. No one, like, there's a scene also where, they're kind of far along and they've unsprung all this stuff. And someone comes out and says, you know, like more than half of the United States could, doesn't know what Watergate even is. Like you guys think you're onto something. People don't give a damn. And it's like everywhere, everywhere they go, people are saying, no one cares. This isn't a story. And they're getting shunned by every single source, but they just, they believe they had conviction and they, the resilience is awesome. The way they just keep going back to the same sources and asking in different ways. Um, the, the amount of persuasiveness they had to show to get to a point where they had a story that broke as hard as it did was fascinating to me. Warren Buffett has a, fa- a fascinating quote. And he says, most people miss opportunity because it's dressed in work boots and overalls. These are two of the most famous journalists in, in the American history. And they're famous because they refuse to be ordinary. They refuse to be told no. They refused 
to believe that they weren't on to something. They had convictions. Like these two guys, they, they said multiple times, like they got brought, like they, they didn't bring this up in the movie, but they got called into court. They literally got called into court and they thought they were going to both go to jail. And they didn't. But they both admitted if we were if we were found guilty, we would have quit this job, we would have quit this profession, and we would have gone to jail. Like we would have stopped. But they weren't proven wrong. But so, like I've I've gone down this rabbit hole way more than than Ian has. There's a movie that came out called Frost Nixon. There was this reporter from Britain whose last name was Frost, and somewhere in the 1970s, after Nixon had left office. Um, they got into like a series of interviews and these things were insanely, insanely popular in the day. And Nixon loses his cool in a moment. And this actually happened, happens in a movie too, but he loses his cool and he screams at him. If you do it and you're the president, it isn't illegal. That's the world he lived in. And he convinced all these people, like I used to date people on Capitol Hill. They all have an incredible ego. Like you're drawn to work at below market wages because you think you're into something bigger. You must have incredible conviction if you're going to beat that. And that's what these guys had, like a gatekeeper, a like a security guard, um, a secretary. Nobody was stopping them. And that's why this ultimately broke the way it did. And it, it, their careers later, I'll talk about in a few minutes, it's what set him up. Uh, one thing I liked about this story is Bradley, who is the manager at the Washington Post and Deep Throat, uh, the untitled source, this number two at the FBI, both of them take a similar approach to coaching um, the, through. Deep Throat won't come right out and give you something that you haven't earned. So Deep Throat, uh -huh. just ask questions. Deep Throat at one point says, that's not how this works. You're going to tell me what you know, and I will confirm if you're on the right path or not. I'm not coming here to just give you your story. Do the work. Because Deep Throat knew at that point, if he did that, he would compromise himself. Because if he just gave him the whole story, there are only a handful of people that know that story, and it would come out. So he needed Woodward to go do the work piece by piece by piece. And there's a, there's a great quote from Bradley where he says, um, I, I can't do the reporting for my reporters, so I have to trust them. And he paused and he goes, and I hate trusting anybody. And that, I, I love that because that throughout the whole movie, that's his style. His style is go back, go get a source. I'm not going to do this for you. I'm not going to write this for you. I'm not going to report this for you. Go do the reporting, go do the hard gritty work, get back on the street and get working. And I think that's a feeling that every manager has um, where a good manager knows I can't do this job for you. And I'm going to have to trust that you can do this job yourself. Yet most of us really hate having to be responsible for a result and having to trust someone else is going to do it. And it's not going to be us doing all the work. And I think that's why, Frank, Frank talked earlier about, we just did an episode on micromanagement. Poor managers would go do the reporting for the reporters and they would take credit for it later. Bradley knew I've, you know, I can't do this for you. If you're going to own this story, if you're going to have your name on everything, you do the reporting, I'll encourage you. I'll point you in the right direction. I'll tell you when you're not headed in the right direction, but I'm not going to do it for you. I'm going to have to trust you. The Washington Post under Ben Bradley won three. They might have won more. I, with Bradley and Woodward, they won three Pulitzer Prizes for reporting. Like that's the preeminent award for reporting. You don't do that by being a micromanager. You don't do that without great people. And what we talk about a lot here is how do you unlock people's talent? there's a scene in the movie what Ian and I joked about earlier where they show up at Bradley's house because they're afraid Woodward and Bernstein are afraid that their houses are bugged so they're on to something and it, like it's towards the end of the movie like they're about to break free like Nixon's about to resign so they go to Bradley's house at like three or four o'clock in the morning and he invites him in and he, he's like they're like what the hell are you doing here and um, they tell him about the buggy and he smiles at him and he says something hysterical but he goes into this line. He goes, sure, you boys are kind of tired. 
congratulations, working hard. Go home, take a shower, take a 15 minute nap and get back to the office and finish the story. And that's what he said to him. And that sounds like malpractice, overtime, a thousand things. Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein didn't care about overtime. What they cared about is getting the story right. And what they did for a short period of time, three years in their late 20s, is they put in all this insane amount of work. And the boss didn't get him held up in bull****. He let them go do what they were doing and he gave them support because that's what good managers do. They say, you want to work hard. You want to be challenged. You want something else. Go do it. Don't let me put rules on you. And we always talk about like people, the, the sixth reason people leave is pay. One through five usually has to do with opportunity, autonomy, and ability to grow. That's what they were feeling. And they had a lot of pressure, but that's absolutely what they were living through. Uh, he has a great line there. Uh, I wrote it down. I loved it when he's inspiring them to go take a 15 minute nap and get your ass back into the office in the middle of the night. Uh, he says, nothing's riding on this, of course, except the first amendment, first amendment freedom the of the press and the future of this country. Uh, and then he just kind of grins at him and it's just an awesome line. Oh, the next line he goes, if you guys this one up again, I'm going to be pretty mad. And he turns around and walks in the house. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think about it. Um, I feel like work-life balance, I think a better way to think about work. I think a lot of people think about work-life balance day to day, week to week. I kind of think of it as periods of my life. Like, do I have a really big mountain to climb that's super exciting where working 16 hour days isn't going to bother me? Um, and I think, I look back at that moment where they had a chance to write one of the biggest stories in the history of the world, um, take down a president who was corrupt. They, they were working 20 hours a day, smoking cigarettes, eating McDonald's, worrying about, worrying about death threats, worrying about their, and it was probably the most energetic, motivating period of their life, even though there was frustrating moments. And I kind of think about whenever I've worked that hard, it, didn't feel like work. There are very few times where I've worked that many hours in a period of time where I didn't just have an awesome goal ahead of me and I wasn't excited about it. And for me, you know, the last three years, I haven't had many of those moments where I've had to work 20 hours and grind my way through. I've got a few that are coming up on the horizon and I see them. I see them coming. I know they're coming. So knowing that, I am absolutely enjoying my free time right now because I know I'm going to have some periods, Frankie, that are going to be pretty stressful for me in the next five years, especially with our startup. Um, but right now I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying as much as I can, but when that moment comes, I might be right back to the old NVR days of getting up at three 30 in the morning and not sleeping a lot. And that's cool. Cause I'm going to have a really exciting goal to go for. You know, maybe I'm not bringing down a president, but I'm going to have something big to shoot for. And I'm going to have no problem putting in those hours when it's time. So there's something that I think is, is worth noting here. There's a, there's a couple of scenes where Ben Bradley is like in a tux. Ben Bradley is establishment. Ben Bradley is between 50 and 65 years old during this stretch of time. And when he was Woodward's manager, he'd reached the, you know, going to the Kennedy Center, going to black tie gallows. These guys were both in their late 20s, early 30s. They were both divorced, no kids, and they leaned in, and they leaned in hard. Malcolm Gladwell wrote in Outliers about how Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were both born within 14 months of each other. They were the perfect timing of people who started the internet or the computer wave. And because it was a very small moment in time. And what you have to look at with work-life balance and other things, we've talked a lot lately about recessions and I'm no longer in my twenties or thirties. I'm in my, own, my late forties. I'm closer to 50 than I am to any other benchmark birthday. And I have a wife and two children. So to me right now, what I need is a little bit more caution than I've ever had, or I'm going to miss my kids growing up because I'm going to be working so hard. So you have to look at these things and you have to understand it. Ben Bradley knew he couldn't write the articles. He knew he couldn't do the research. He didn't have the energy. He didn't have the time. He had a family. He had kids. He had dogs. These are the guys to do it. 
And if the Washington Post is going to win this fucking story, those are going to be the guys who do it. The young, hungry ones, not the ones that are 15 years older with mortgages, the hungry ones. And that is brilliant management. That is looking at how do we take down a Goliath? We do it with chip by chip by chip, with people who have incredible amounts of energy. And that's the coolest part of this story is how it happened. If it's the wrong paper, if it's the wrong ownership, it doesn't, get, this doesn't happen. And that's what I think is, I think is really interesting. I love it. So uh, thank you for enlightening me. Thank you for teaching me about a political incident 50 years ago. Uh, I did, I did take a lot out of this uh, story. It's actually a pretty cool movie. If you want to see it, I did not watch the post. I have to be honest. I only watched all the president's men. I did not read the book. So I kind of, I did the uh, Jeff Paxson school of cliff notes and watched the movie. If there would have been a comic book, I would have read it because that would have been faster than the two hours and 15 minutes to watch the movie. But um, uh, Robert Redford's a pretty good actor. So it was a, a good flick. So before we wrap, let, let, let's, let's talk about something else. And it's either reputation or residuals. And we can call it whatever you want to call it. Bob Woodward, as we've talked about, he's, he's Bernstein's great. Woodward's the star. Woodward uh, got to post another Pulitzer during 9-11. Woodward um, became basically the voice of every Republican for sure, but most presidents um, after uh, Carter, like he was close with Bush, um, Bush one, Reagan, um, W all the way through. He didn't get along great with Clinton, but the point of the matter is he protected a source. He did hard work and he protected a source. And there's a quote in here that I want to read you. Um, it's, um, I need a second. Here it is. It's from a guy named David Gergen. And um, he worked at the White House during um, the Richard Nixon and three subsequent administrations. And he said in 2000, uh, in his book, The Eyewitness of Power, about Woodward's reporting, I don't accept everything he writes as gospel. He can get details wrong. But generally, his accounts in both his books and, and in the Post are remarkably reliable and demand serious attention. I am convinced he writes only what he believes to be true or has been reliably told to be true. And he is certainly a force for keeping the government honest. There's two reasons he ended up there. He does meticulous work. He researches. He is an investigative reporter. The other reason is, is he became a reliable source. If you knew something, you called him. He, anything that happened in Washington, the United States for about a 30 year period, he was the guy you knew that wouldn't burn you as a, as a source. He'd protect you, he'd do the other work. And what happened is this became, literally you don't use the term Babe Ruth very often. The Babe Ruth of reporting because he had an incredible work ethic and he was someone you could trust. If you put those two things together, you can move mountains. We talk about like writing letters to our investors. Like if you can be a good communicator and you can be trusted, you can set yourself apart. And we did the episode of micromanaging. What happens in a lot of instances, if you're getting micromanaged, people don't trust you. That's what this guy did is he separated himself in a murky world being someone who could be trusted. Frank, what are you the Babe Ruth of? Lunch. I think I'm the Babe Ruth of eating peanut butter right out of the jar. I don't, I don't think a day goes by that I don't eat peanut butter right out of a jar with a fork. Uh, I eat a lot of peanut butter. I, I, it's I, so good. I might be the Babe Ruth of peanut butter eating. It, it's, it's an insane amount of jars of peanut butter we go through to the point where it gets, Jenny gets pretty pissed off at me uh, because the kids need it for their lunches, but I will eat like an entire jar of it. And she'll be like, how is there no peanut butter this morning? We just, I just bought that yesterday. I'd be like, uh. So I'd love to get a bowl and put like two or three scoops of peanut butter in it and then throw like shaved almonds on top of it or some pistachios and then hit it with a little bit of honey. Oh, it's just delicious. A couple of chocolate chips. <laughs> Frankie, do you have anything else to take us home with on uh, Watergate? Watergate was dubbed maybe the single greatest reporting effort of all time. I think it happened for a few reasons. I think it happened because of a great paper and a great owner. I think it happened because of great management. And I think it happened because we had the right people reporting it. Um, without all of those things, this doesn't happen. 
And what we talk about on Let Me Speak to a Manager, besides the and I are both pretty fat, is uh, in our bad dietary choices, is management, businesses, structure. Everything that happened inside of this story and the things that we highlighted allow for it. And something newsworthy and noteworthy that we're still talking about 50 years later is because it had the right place to grow. It was, uh, th that's old news though, that it was the greatest uh, reporting of all time. It is now second behind, let me speak to a manager's reporting of the reporting of Watergate on this episode is now the greatest reporting in the history of mankind. It's funny in all of my research, nobody said Woodward or Bernstein did any half-ass internet research. Not true here. <laughs> Frank dug deep on this one. I got to tell you, normally uh, Frank will hit the Wikipedia page and that's about all you're going to get off of him. He read multiple books, saw lots of movies multiple times. He was really into it. So I hope, I hope you guys appreciate just how damn hard Frank worked on this episode. I thought it was fascinating, Frankie. Thank you for enlightening me. Ian, it's always a pleasure. You Watergate-loving son of a bitch, you. See you, buddy. <laughs> yes, sir. See you.